to the panel uh, first question of uh, are we uncovering anything at, at, as designers we don't see a way around are we coming up against any intrinsic <laughs> issues here that we can't design around or are we starting to find these intrinsic issues so would uh, Someone like to nod their head and they'd like to begin? Uh, uh, my, my, <laughs> my, my, yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment. I think, I think the, uh, my, my situation is the temper of the expectations. Okay, initially I think, I think we uh, manage the expectations. I think there, it still seems to me that there is, there is a very narrow window. The window is getting shorter and shorter, but there is a possibility. I think the on-off ratio is, uh, that swing is a real issue. I don't think we'll get to six orders of magnitude. But if I am trying to turn on and off within 0.3 volt or so, I probably, you know, even like four orders of magnitude is plenty good because that still beats a special CMOS. So I think we've got to focus on, on that and find an application space. Now, whether that would be exciting enough for uh, Intel or Global or TSMC or Samsung, uh, we don't know. But, um, but it seems that very low voltage device for small form factor without cooling solutions needed, I think is a, is a good way to go. That's where I see. Okay. So no showstopper, but maybe limited application. I mean, there, there are no, fun, I mean, it's tough to say how fundamental are the showstopper, but I think we, there is still, it's not a situation where we give up. We still, we still keep, keep working. Uh, uh, other uh, comments? Well, but actually, you know, MOSFETs uh, in a self-threshold regime, they can give you five orders of magnitude in 300 millivolts, no? So you, s so you should do better than five orders of magnitudes in 300 millivolts, because yeah. otherwise MOSFET can do that. And <laughs> but then again, you know, you don't get 60 millivolts per decade when you scale everything down, so, so, so yeah. It's, I mean, when you're benchmarking with FinFET, they're very well electrostatically um, controlled. Mm -hmm. so, so I still think that. that Okay, I don't. Oh, everybody has. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I was I was hoping to share. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Takagi-san. Yeah, actually, yeah, basically the same opinion with the uh, Suman. But actually, I'm also collaborating with the uh, Toshiba people in Japan, and we have uh, some uh, TFET project in Japan. Actually, Toshiba is also very interested in the uh, uh, kind of very special applications. For IoT or something, so therefore, um, and also they, they are now planning to make a TFET by using silicon because they don't care about the high ion because uh, their application is very specific. But still, the um, conventional processing is very important. So therefore, I would agree with their opinion as in the, in the first initial stage because anyway, a TFET must be. Um, yeah, we are ex our expectation is the uh, implementation of the TFET into integrated systems. So therefore, silicon plateau must be used and also high design or layout, everything must be realized. So therefore, any good startup of the TFET integrated systems by using silicon technology is needed. So therefore, maybe our expectation is we start up the uh, kind of very specific, but the very low power, uh, centric application uh, should be found and the apply and the maybe small volume production started. After that, maybe by using all our knowledge or new materials uh, like uh, 3 5 Germanium 2D and the uh, improved ion, maybe the market becomes larger and larger. So therefore, still the 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 uh, the important point is the uh, very uh, low I off, and also the uh, 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 steepest factor in uh, some range of the current must be uh, satisfied for specific applications. So therefore, still, I believe that there is a hope. <laughs> but we, in the in the first talk from Patrick, he tried to quantify what is the level of quality of the junction that has to be there, and I think I understood that you you need. Uh, maybe 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 uh, defects, uh, level defects density. Is that what you're saying? Uh, is that what, what Takagi-san has to produce? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's what I claimed in my talk, and I think I still uh, stick by that. Um, but I, I found uh, 
Professor Takagi's results to be pretty interesting because of the very important characteristic that it seemed to be uh, temperature independent. Um, and I claimed in my talk that uh, if you have traps, you're always going to have uh, temperature dependence. But um, I think that's, it, it is also possible for, uh, in that regime, that your uh, trap-assisted tunneling rate was not really limited by thermal activation, but rather by the uh, tunneling probability, which can be very low and very rapidly modulated at uh, low current levels. So, um, so I think, so that process would be temperature independent, and maybe there's a way to combine this uh, tunnel barrier with modulation, which can be very steep at low densities, with um, with uh, and somehow transition that into the high current regime where we don't really have a steep mechanism, possibly without dealing with the traps problem. But uh, I think either way, it's going to be very difficult. And, and Jamie, you pointed out the the OJ generation. Is yeah, that going to be a significant problem for us? Or we I think the question we need to ask is, uh, and, I, and you point this out in your review paper. Um, you look at all these experimental devices, and we haven't had a we haven't had a sub uh, 60 sub threshold swing for currents over 10 nanoamps per micron. 10 nanoamps per micron. That is small. That's going to be really hard to make an energy efficient device out of that. And even the new results we're seeing are at these very very small currents. So I believe that we can make something steep in a small current regime. There's effects that I would expect to have steepness there, but if we're really targeting you know, this post CMOS, if that's our goal, is really to target you know, what comes, not necessarily a MOSFET replacement, but an a, a ally, I guess, that would be on the chip, we're nowhere near that. And we can't explain why our, our, all of our TFETs at higher current densities have such poor subthreshold swings, and it's really poor. And we haven't answered that question, and so we need to answer that question. And I proposed a, a, a methodology that might explain some of those things. And so the, the MOSFET always looks, looks hard to beat, and I, I think it's looking harder and harder and harder to beat. Uh, well, not for sub, subthreshold swing, because they can't go there. <laughs> well, but then there's all the subthreshold logic, and there's all the energy advantages that you can do. Uh, yeah, you can't necessarily do subthreshold swing, but at the end of the day, what we care about is for a set voltage, what's our on-off ratio, and what what's our on current, and for that we haven't we haven't won at at all. Uh, so I don't know. I are we allowed to ask questions? So I was yeah. now wondering. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering then um, if the problem statement we move it to, okay, steep slope over two, three hours of magnitude, but at very low ID, then maybe we've got to think about should we be doing TALFIS or should we be doing something like NAM electromechanical you know, uh, type, of, uh, type of devices? Because they can give you the, the, one of the issues there is that, you know, so, that, so, so are we. Are we, are we still focusing on the right, right problem then? That was, that was yesterday's <laughs> Oh, I missed that. I was on a plane. <laughs> but I think that moves us into another space of uh, okay. lower speed and maybe hysteri hysteresis to deal with, and maybe uh, that's beyond what we want to go through here. But maybe we do. Okay, so um, I think we're still in denial, in spite of the fact that we've made some progress uh, this morning. And uh, let me uh, focus in on the talk, for example, by uh, Dr. Oseni. Uh, a, very, uh, a very strong focus on uh, the subthreshold swing, which has always been the case in this field. Uh, but my understanding is the way you, you, you had a very neat way of introducing defects, which normally don't get introduced very easily into the computational models. And uh, so I think that's great that you introduced the defect. But then you also have to introduce the, the density of defects and compare them to the uh, density that you're uh, tunneling into. Now, tunneling is an interfacial phenomenon. And uh, so the 2D density states is very, very relevant for tunneling. So that's your 10 to the 12. And uh, we had Professor Takagi, Takagi showing us. He's very proud. He's made a lot of progress. And he's gotten the, the uh, DIT defect density down to 10 to the 11 that should have produced an on-off ratio of only 10. 
yet uh, all of you showed really good on-off ratios. And I suspect that this is because of the second mechanism, the mechanism of uh, tunnel thickness modulation. Yeah. And, that's, and all the good results are due to that, and uh, none of the good results are due to the mechanism we all want, uh, which is the density the of states filtering. So I'd like to get a, a resolution. There's a apparent contradiction. Very good on-off ratios were shown, but simple thinking says the on-off ratio should have been maybe 10. <laughs> well, 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 I think Eli, what you're saying is that the energy filtering only gives us that sub 60, right? So where that switching slope versus ID, how far it will go and over what range it will occur over how much ID range. Maybe it's only 10, maybe it's only 100 if you're lucky. But that doesn't mean that, but we still have a little bit of gate swing to modulate the tunnel, tunnel width to get to you know, the on current that we need. So, you know, because MOSFET is also degrading, right? As we are, as we are going, uh, as we are flattening out the, the junction. So the, the, the DIT that doesn't just harm the on-off ratio; it also harms the uh, uh, the, the rate. Yeah. 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 So but what I'm saying is that your arg your argument of the filtering part, which is all we are hoping our you know uh, all our dreams on, if it happens over two orders of magnitude, yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's the only, that's it. No, but we, we have the idea of DIT. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. No, we, we. But the, the problem I have is a lot of these presentations show tremendous uh, uh, ratios, tremendous on off ratios. But we are expanding the voltage scale. Okay. Uh, so let me give uh, Takagi san a chance to respond to the question yeah. about whether tunnel uh, thickness modulation is controlling the on off. Yeah, actually, I'm not part of this true, but uh, the. Still, um, for example, thinking the simple uh, real direct tunneling and also trap assist tunneling, we, we compare to mechanism. Actually, the uh, tunnel mechanism is not exactly the same because the uh, trap assisted one should have the, uh, the uh, thermal activated process. So therefore, maybe we, we, maybe we can directly get the uh, on-off ratio by comparing the density of state and maybe some effectiveness of the TAT and also direct tunneling might be different. So therefore, some uh, different value can be expected. I, I think you proved that the tunneling assisted, uh, the trap assisted tunneling is not a big factor in your very nice ID curves. Uh, but that means that there must be some other mechanism that is dominant. And I'm saying the other mechanism is tunnel distance modulation, which we know about, which gives good results at low current. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it looks to me that there, there is a paradox in the sense that if you say that uh, the best swing comes when the bands are just, uh, the band overlap just appears, right? So at that point, uh, the usual or known semiconductors, your density of states is just starting. So there is, I don't see how you can get a lot of current if your swing, best swing comes at that point. So it looks like that if you uh, say that, okay, I cannot get a lot of current right at that point, then of course you are uh, you are never going to get a lot of high on current with a good swing in this process unless you find a semiconductor where where the uh, band starts, you almost have a humongous density, density system, which we seem to not have right now. Right? No, but it's not in, in low dimensional systems, I mean, if you take a 2D, not to mention 1D, well, in the 1D, you also have a peak of density states right at the bottom of the band. I mean, and in 2D systems, there's relatively flat, you know, inside the band. And uh, I think that in 2D systems, even in 2D systems, uh, you can have a pretty good uh, density states right. Provided that, uh, and that is probably something that should be thrown into the, pre into the discussion, Provided that the models that we have uh, for you know the decay of the density of states in the supposed gap uh, are good enough, and instead we don't simply have some sort of uh, you know just smoother decrease of the density of states in the supposed gap than we think we have, in which case uh, we could be in trouble since this is supposed to be uh, you know a density of state switch. So, so I guess. Uh, Van Hoff singularities in the low dimensional systems there, 
what, it, what matters is the integrated value of that density of states. How many electrons do you have? And there you do not win over a 3D material. If you look at the number of electrons you have within that singularity, it always gives you a finite number. Although at that point, the singularity gives you infinity, the integration value still gives you a finite number of electrons, and that is always smaller than a 3D material in a low dimensional material. So I don't think that solved the problem. A question over here. Um, so I think one of the speakers asked maybe themselves uh, rightly, why haven't we understood this till today? There are a lot of back of the envelope approaches. There are like David's uh, insightful approaches putting there. But I think what we're missing is like you can have Suman's data and try to understand full model of an, why does the experimental data showing what it's so showing. It's not the NEGS which I, I'm, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, did the same uh, approach, but I think we are at the level it's been so many years, we should be looking at uh, uh, experimental devices, really good collaboration with very, uh, you know, th uh, theoretical people to exactly understand, fit what's going on with these devices. A lot of pieces, it's not, uh, traps are an issue, but it's not trap assisted tunneling only the issue. The, uh, it's the, we have MOSFET has the, the same DIT issue, it's electrostatic, it's there too. So I'm not claiming I know everything, but why haven't we done, uh, it's a real general question, it's been seven, eight years, why haven't we focused on explaining the experimental devices, exactly the devices that's been built? <laughs> um, so uh, you, you said the, the traps are bad because they mess up the uh, gate efficiency, uh, but there is a second way the, tra the traps are bad. This has been a sort of a, a big theme this morning, is the, the traps are bad because you can tunnel into the traps and then you could be thermally excited. I, I, I agree. I didn't say otherwise. Yeah. So, so both of them has to be uh, accounted right. for is what I uh, suggested. Uh, I, I, Suman, maybe you can answer from your side. Uh, the question why is haven't been exactly spent a lot of focus on explaining the exact curve? We have done some modeling, but not necessarily. I haven't seen uh, perfect detailed explanation of the uh, uh, the parts, temperature dependence, and etc. To explain every part. I mean, we have done that to some extent. I think the question is what detail are we going after, right? The, um, I mean, you can start from atomistic ab initio, build a supercell and go all the way um, and uh, to a continuum model. But I think uh, most data, temperature dependent IV data clearly shows these different regimes of transport. I think that was, that was there for a while. I mean, as soon as we built the device, we understood that. Now, the question is, um, I think the way a field progresses is initially people said, oh, your ion sucks. In tunnel fit, you'll never get ion. And then uh, people chase that, you know, the ion part. Then we said, okay, we're getting the ion, but my subthreshold is degrading, you know, or on-off ratio is degrading. So, so I think it's, uh, but now we have a huge amount of data set, right? Uh, and, and we are clearly seeing the trend that all the steep slopes are happening at very low on current. And I think uh, that's a good, good, good experimental data. And I think maybe, maybe now we are in a good position to come up with one simple unified model <laughs> to explain that entire trend. Uh, I just want to uh, reinforce Uyghur's comment. Maybe, maybe I'm quibbling with you a little bit. Suman, I'm not sure. Uh, you have Eli sitting here saying, I understand what's going on. Uh, all of these data are coming from uh, tunnel width modulation, tunnel distance modulation and a little bit, maybe a one order of magnitude worth of density of states modulation. I think Uyghur's got exactly the right point. You know, Eli's hand-waving. Uh, hand-waving only gets us, <laughs> hand-waving no. only gets you so far. So I think he has exactly the point. You know, what you need is quantitative modeling to, to really, I, yes. I think, uh, validate so, or discount, the, you know, the hand-waving. No, no, no argument with that. The question is to what detail we want to go to, right? I mean, I can have a drift diffusion, a continuum model, pretty much predict a 40 nanometer fin fit with, with the right tweaks, right? And, and we feel good about it. And we can move on and do, you know, uh, circuit simulation and system design, next system design. Or we can go back and, 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 and I think that's, that's, we should do that. I'm not, I'm not arguing not. But the, I think we are kind of understanding this system. I mean, I, 
I don't see any surprises right now. I'm sure you have the uh, uniform agreement about what are the key issues. So to, to that point, uh, I, showed, I showed the slide at the, uh, the first page of the talk showing uh, how the simulations, exp the, sh the simulation transfer uh, characteristics varied. And the low performing curves, the ones that were, didn't look too spectacular, those were done at Purdue uh, by Matthew Louisier. And he did atomistic yeah, modeling. And a lot of the negative results came in when he started including phonon effects and phonon coupling. And so yeah, that's really hard to do. And so we haven't been doing it as a field, but we definitely need to be doing that. And uh, once you start talking about phonons, I would argue we need to start talking about Auger effects, which are essentially electron-electron interactions, which are really hard to do atomistically and things like that. So yes, we need to do that. Um, we need to make an effort to do that. So I uh, wanted to comment on Eli's and Uger's uh, comments, but uh, it, I think it's a really big fallacy to assume that your on-off will be limited by the difference in the density of states between interface states and the 2D density of states that you're tunneling into, because there's a lot of prefactors in front of that, and, that will, and those change with gate voltage as well. And I think the real thing that we should look, look at is what is the ch generation, change in generation rate with the change in gate voltage. And you can split that off into two terms. Or what is the change in current with the change in uh, gate voltage? And you can split it into two terms. You can split it off into the change in generation rate with change in electric field. And then the change in electric field with the change in gate voltage. And if you scale EOT and uh, if you scale EOT and your body thicknesses, the second term will scale and it'll become sharper. But the question at the end of the day is, what is the first term? And uh, I'm, I am sure the panelists can comment on what they think they can do to change the, uh, this first term. So uh, as the experimentalist, actually simply the characterization is not sufficient. For example, Actually, we're making devices and also try to uh, simulate the uh, results, but it, it's not easy because simply uh, it, we still don't know exactly the geometrical structure after making devices because the, actually the tunneling uh, FET is controlled by very tiny so near source region point. So therefore, we carefully uh, identify that all the detail of the geometry on the impurity profile, everything must be clarified. Otherwise, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, prediction of the simulation cannot be done, actually. But it, usually, it is very difficult to get uh, sufficient information. So therefore, there are so many parameters like uh, defect density, bulk defect density, okay. DIT, everything. All very good points. I'd like to kind of wrap this up with a, with a final question. Say no, I just wanted to hear from uh, Dr. No, well, I was just, uh, actually, it was a comment to uh, the question that we had and also the previous one. I mean, I agree that we should be probably more focused, uh, at least in some, uh, uh, some devoted papers, just to have a comparison between modern and simulations. Uh, um, the fact is that, uh, actually, even going back to the previous question concerning the fact that it's not very intuitive that you can have a pretty decent current when you have the crossing and crossing of the bands because the density of states is necessarily small, that I agree. It's a fact that when you consider some, let's say, relatively established, uh, I mean, uh, models that are considered quite uh, uh, sophisticated, uh, as in the non-equilibrium Green's function are based on the tight binding, uh, approach or even on k dot p, you, you have all of this, no? That is in, except, uh, let's say, maybe defects, uh, except uh, the, 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 the finite steepness of the bands. You have all of this and still you get high V characteristics. Uh, there would be, we would be very, very glad to see in experiments. But instead, we do not see these uh, actually uh, characteristics in experiments. So even this more, let's say, fundamental, uh, I mean, I agree with you. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but at the end of the day, it is also quantitative. No, you have to take a look at what you see from numerical simulations. And you, could, you get something that would be, we would be absolutely delighted to see in experiments, but, but we don't.
So probably uh, there is uh, actually something that we are not quite grasping in, uh, in, uh, in, in the models. I mean, that's, uh, this discrepancy with what we see in experiments is uh, something that is quite a disappointing, I believe. Can I make another comment? <laughs> sure. So uh, I agree with you because uh, at some point uh, uh, towards the beginning of my career here, I was doing some simulations on... Oh, of course, that. I'm very well aware <laughs> of that. <laughs> so, yes, we will be very delighted to see that kind of behavior in the experiment. But my point is, if you look at those behavior, that is actually not good enough if you just look at on-off versus VDD. Meaning, if you just take a uh, non-equilibrium function um, uh, calculated IDVG characteristics. The minimum sub-threshold swing in most of the cases you get is of the order of 30 millivolt per decade. And if you bring in phonons and all, it goes up to 36, 38 millivolt per decade. And what happens is that on average you can kind of hope to get around 35 or so. So you go up like three orders, three and a half orders of magnitude, and then it starts to become actually really bad. So I'm just trying to say that Yes, the experiment is not at that level probably, but I'm just saying that even that is probably not good enough as a goal because the kind of goal that we want to hit is probably a few hundred microamp per micron uh, below 200 millivolt or 250 millivolt, right? So I don't think that the good simulations actually even say that you can hit that level. That's, uh, that's a, uh, might, might, might be right, but I still experiments are lagging behind, I mean, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to just bring this to a close uh, with a one final question for the whole audience, because we started this session with, or this, started this morning with Bob Colwell t telling us about uh, where are the bugs, and we are the designers now, and we've just talked about a bunch of the, I wouldn't know if I call them bugs, but refinements in our theory, but what are we missing? What else, what are the things, uh, we could kind of throw out here is being missed so far in this discussion. And this, the, I answered it, the, you know, we heard some, some about variability. Is variability a really a worry? Is uh, other people want to throw out other things that we really, as designers, need to be starting to think more about at this stage? Well, I should definitely worry about variability yes. after devices work, but actually, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I, I, to my understanding, it's a bit point. premature. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It's an optimistic v yeah. viewpoint, but I mean, it's that's like the designer saying, "Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put in that feature later when uh, I have a product." Uh, Secure hardware. <laughs> I think the point is variability, not from device to device, but the inhomogeneity is within the device. Right, so what, what is causing additional fluctuations beyond the DITs and beyond uh, the, you know, the, ba the band edge um, homogeneous broadening? There must be some other kinds of inhomogeneous uh, effects that are affecting these, the, the, at least the 2D, 2D type devices, or three, even, and certainly the 3D. A, a comment that I have about the, this question that actually made me think about is that uh, actually, for instance, uh, uh, we've been discussing this even in the E2Switch project in Europe and in the media, and many, well, many, I would say all, the experimental data that you see uh, in uh, um, nanowire-based uh, tunnel FETs, uh, these are typically come from quite many nanowires that are in parallel, okay? And that's a pretty subtle point because, uh, of course, uh, even if you had one out of 100 nanowires that has a very good substratial slope, when, when, you, when, you, when you actually measure 100 of them in parallel, just the dispersion <laughs> wire to wire is going to wash out uh, this, uh, this very good guy. Uh, mm -hmm. We're never going to see it. I mean, uh, if, you, if you measure tens, not to, to say 100 uh, uh, nanowires in parallel, that's interesting because I think that in very few experimental devices that uh, you can measure just individual nanowires or say very few nanowires as opposed to tens or a hundred nanowire in parallel. Okay, that, I'm leave, leave, leave that as the last comment and uh, we'll carry this discussion off into lunch. So I'd like to join, join me in welcoming <laughs>